pylon using a specialized machine recommended by the manufacturer. But because they've removed the massive engine pylon assembly together, now it has to be replaced as one unit. Using a forklift, workers inadvertently crack the top section of the pylon called the flange as they try to fit the assembly back onto the plane. Because they were using a forklift to try and hold this heavy engine up while they put these two big bolts in place to hold the, the pylon on the wing. They created a stress situation that over a period of time when the airplane was returned to service caused one of the bolts to fail. This morning investigators were out on runway 32 right at O'Hare Airport looking for a bolt about four inches long. The crack is hidden from view so it goes undetected. With every takeoff and landing cycle putting stress on the broken flange, the crack is growing and no one knows it. Eight weeks after the engine change, when Flight 191 takes off on that warm spring afternoon, suddenly, without warning, disaster. Takeoff is when this engine's producing the most thrust, when there's the most force on this pylon is during takeoff. So if it were going to fail, it makes absolutely perfect sense it would fail shortly after takeoff. As Flight 191 starts to lift off at the end of the runway, the cracked flange fails, ripping the engine away and taking with it a portion of the left wing's leading edge, which causes a loss of hydraulic fluid. As a result, the left wing slats retract, the left wing loses lift, and the rest, sadly, is history. When our parents died uh, initially, we would have all of their friends, a lot of friends, saying, well, isn't this wonderful? They all, they, they went, went together, together. And they were and so they, young. And, and, they, you and they loved one another and whatever. And I can remember at the time I had to kind of choke back saying, no, I don't think this is wonderful. Seven months after the accident, the safety board issues several critical and immediate recommendations for airlines. Among them, airlines must discontinue the unapproved maintenance practice and inspect pylon attach points on all DC-10s by approved inspection methods. The safety board also recommends that airlines change their flight manuals so pilots know not to ever reduce speed in such a scenario, as in the case of Flight 191. Neither American Airlines nor McDonnell Douglas ever admitted any fault in this accident. But the two companies agreed to share the cost of settlements in more than 200 lawsuits that were filed. Every accident and incident, because of its unique characteristics, we're always going to learn something. And we have to take those lessons learned. We've got to heed those lessons, and we've got to enhance aviation safety. We don't want those people to have died in vain. Flying requires trust that all the people involved, ground crews, mechanics, pilots, are doing what they're supposed to do, and that the aeroplane itself will function normally. But for the passengers of this unlucky flight, that trust is about to be shaken when a cargo door explodes open in mid-air. In 1989, I was a practicing trial lawyer in Denver. I hadn't had a vacation in about three years. Bruce Lampert is a licensed pilot and an aviation attorney who represents plane crash victims. He never imagined he'd end up experiencing a deadly incident in the sky. I had just completed working extensively on Northwest 255, a crash in Detroit, Michigan. I was about to get started on a new case Continental 1713 in Denver, Colorado, and I had a three-week break in between those two cases. This was going to be a vacation that I would uh, uh, really remember. February the 24th, 1989, 2 a.m. United Airlines Flight 811 is en route from Honolulu to Auckland in New Zealand. 355 people are on board for the night flight over the Pacific. Takeoff and initial climb are normal. We were settling in for, for uh, a restful flight, and the aircraft was climbing. But as the Boeing 747 approaches 23,000 feet, the shock of a lifetime. There was uh, an explosion. Uh, everything that wasn't tied down was airborne. 
These dramatic animations put you next to the plane as the forward right cargo door rips open in flight, slams upward, creating a gaping hole in the fuselage, and then falls from the plane. The resulting massive depressurization sucks out two rows of seats and nine passengers. The door swung out. It's an outward opening door. And there's a stop that keeps it from going up all the way. But in flight, the air loads were such that it just kept going right through that stop and went all the way up and slammed against the fuselage above the door. And it actually fractured that, that fuselage above the door. In one second, their fellow passengers were sitting there with magazines and, and uh, drinks uh, with their reading lights on. And then a nanosecond later, they were gone. The structural integrity of the main deck has failed extensively. There's a 10 by 15 foot hole in the fuselage and debris has been sucked into both engines on that side. The inboard number three engine is pulsing fire. Number four is also failing. The pilot begins a rapid descent to an altitude where passengers can breathe normally. They declared an emergency and en route back to the airport, they had to literally shut down both the number three and number four engines. So now they're flying this big four engine aircraft on two engines. That in and of itself is a challenge for any pilot. For passengers, it's a moment of pure terror. Someone in business class manages to snap this photo as the plane is quickly descending. You know, everyone likes to think that in a stressful situation that, that, that you will act properly, you will act heroically. That you will do the right thing. But when you can do nothing, there's no place to go, there's no place to run. You can't scream because no one can hear you. So what do you do? You sit there with your hands folded in your lap and you look at the people around you. And there is very little comfort from watching others who are experiencing the same threat that you are. Then, out of nowhere, there's a sudden glimmer of hope. I remember seeing a number of the passengers on the right side pointing to the windows. And if you looked out the window, you could see there were lights. There were the lights of Honolulu. There were lights of Hawaii. And we could see land. After 20 nerve-wracking minutes, United Flight 811 touches down in Honolulu. A cheer, like a roller coaster ride, uh, and hands were thrown up above their heads as everybody uh, exclaimed their, their, their joy that the airplane had touched down. This photograph was taken during the evacuation. 346 surviving passengers and crew get off the plane, fast. And people say, how in the world could everybody get off that quick? And I tell them we had a very highly motivated group of people. A grinding noise woke me up. There was a, a bang and a flash. I looked up. The whole right-hand side of the business compartment had gone. The uh, sound of the explosion, the feeling of the explosion, and the violence of the explosion is awesome. And I hope none of you have to go through it. It's a tragedy for the families of the nine passengers who don't survive, and a trauma for the rest. But at least it's over. But for investigators, the story is just beginning. They see that the cargo door is missing. What they don't know is why did it open in flight? Coming up, the cargo door is a key piece of evidence, but how will investigators find it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Where was it? It doesn't have a beacon, it doesn't have a transponder. And more deadly crashes as planes are taken to breaking point. The airplane became less and less controllable to the point that it was no longer controllable at all. When any structural element of an aeroplane fails, the result can be fatal. A 747 has a cargo door blown out in mid-flight. The decompression is so powerful, it sucks two rows of seats and nine passengers out of the plane in a split second. Okay, this is taken from row 17, the aisle seat. 
This video, shot by attorney Bruce Lampert two weeks after the fatal accident, documents the violent aftermath of United Airlines Flight 811. Investigators immediately know the problem centers on the cargo door. They can tell from the gaping hole where it used to be. Why did it explode open, plummeting to the Pacific Ocean below? But the key piece investigators would like to examine, the cargo door itself, is lost at sea. With no hard evidence, the safety board issues a report 14 months after the accident, based on previous problems with other 747 cargo doors. The report mentions a possible electrical malfunction in the cargo door locking mechanisms. Wreckage is falling out of the ceiling. But aviation insiders recall most of the blame falling on the ground crew at Honolulu Airport. It's one of the most interesting stories in uh, aviation accident investigation because initially it was thought that the people closing the door had not done it properly and that the door had not been sealed and latched properly. A number of employees that worked for the airline had come forward after the probable cause saying of all the individuals that worked in Honolulu, this person would be the least likely to not close the door properly. He was known for being very meticulous. Uh, but absent any physical uh, evidence to the contrary, the NTSB is bound by facts. And the best estimate of the facts at that time said that he didn't close the door properly. Is it human error or is there another explanation? It wasn't until a year and a half later when the Navy went down and actually found the cargo door, the two pieces of the cargo door, brought them back up and they were examined that the real cause or the true cause of the event was identified. To follow the cargo door failure on United Flight 811, it's important to understand the two-step locking system that secures 747 cargo doors. First, a series of C-shaped latches electronically rotates around pins in the bottom of the door frame. Then, for further reinforcement, a handle moves L-shaped arms called locking sectors up against the sea latches to keep them in place. In addition, there are pins up and down both sides of the door. Normally, all of this holds the door shut. But in the case of United Flight 811, something goes horribly wrong. A forensic analysis of the, of the door indicated that um, there was actually a short circuit an electrical problem that had caused unexpectedly a command to unlock the door um, to actually come open so that it was a, a design issue. Finding that cargo door obviously was critical to, to answering this question. It was so critical that the National Transportation Safety Board actually reissued the report with a different uh, and more up-to-date cause as well as causing all 747s to be redesigned uh, to prevent this kind of failure from occurring again. So it was a case where the industry learned a very valuable lesson. The final cause, according to the safety board, was faulty wiring that allowed the properly closed door to unlatch sometime between the closing of the door and takeoff. In other words, it happened on the ground, but the ground crew didn't do it. Before this accident, there were other documented cases of electrical problems with cargo doors on 747s. In fact, Boeing had alerted airlines to the problem, and the US Federal Aviation Authority had given the airlines nearly two years to perform the $2,000 per door upgrade at the airline's expense. When United 811 took off on the 24th of February, 1989, the deadline was a year away and the problem was scheduled to be corrected by United two months after the accident. To this day, that angers passenger Dick Gutschel. There was a warning out by the FAA that that door had a problem. United chose not to correct it. That's the only thing that really bothered me because you know, I still fly United, I still like them. But they made a mistake there, they did not fix the problem when they could have fixed it. Aviation attorney Bruce Lampert ended up representing about 40 of his fellow passengers in lawsuits against United. Without admitting any wrongdoing, the airline did settle lawsuits for millions of dollars. As I told the lawyers for United, I would much prefer 
getting on an airplane where nothing happens and have no cases than to be on an airplane that blows up at 23,000.